Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Dustin Fox, Jason Lloyd, Tyvis Powell, plus, da 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 da, you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. <laughs> the ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! What a victory last night at Huntington Bank Field. Your Cleveland Browns over the Pittsburgh Steelers in one of the best games of the year. I'm Jay Crawford. Over the next 30 minutes, among other things, we're going to talk about the future of Kevin Stefanski. On the hot seat, but is he safe? Bull. I'm Adam the Bull, and the Guardians had a great season, but can they back it up? They've already made one move this offseason. What's next? We'll get to that a little bit later. G. I'm G. Bush, captain of the Kool-Aid Mafia. One year ago, about a year or so ago, Nick Chubb was laying on the field in Pittsburgh. We'll talk about his redemption story coming up next. Jason. And I'm Jason Lloyd. The Cavs have a problem. They have too many good players. <laughs> How do you get them all on the court at the same time? We're going to talk about their best rotation they should use. Mikey. The Browns beat the Steelers in a snow globe Thursday night football. We're going to get you all the biggest storylines and the best analysis you can find from there. 19 to 24. I said that backwards. That was dumb. Yeah. 24 to 19 win over Pittsburgh last night. And this, of course, is the debut of that awful mustache on Channel 3. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mike decided he was just going to keep the mustache. Girlfriend likes it, so it stays for now. <laughs> and they won. It's good luck. I yeah. like that. I like your commitment to Cleveland sports teams. <laughs> I love it, in fact. All right, let's start with the Browns. Guys, Kevin Stefanski has been squarely on the hot seat. We've talked about his future here. There have been some that have, in the media, that have just come out and said, yeah, it's time for him to go. Uh, now he wins last night's game, but even before the game, and maybe he coached a little freer, I don't know, the reports were from guys that we know and trust that he is completely safe. And some reports said Andrew Barry being completely safe. What do we make about the future of Kevin Stefanski here with the Cleveland Browns? Jason? I thought you're going to start to see over the course of the next few weeks and a couple of months – the Mike Vrabel tour because Mike Vrabel's trying to get back in. And the Browns are very much backing this. He's going to be on the Manning cast tonight. You're going to see stories popping up about him coming up. And and the Browns are supporting getting Mike's name out there because he wants a job next year. He wants to get back in. The only way I thought Kevin could be in trouble is if they wanted Mike Vrabel. And if that was the case, the Browns would not be supporting this. You're right. So that told me even before any reports of, of yesterday, they were going to stick with Kevin Stefanski because the Browns are supporting putting Mike Vrabel out there to get another job next year. So I'm not surprised at all. You can build a, I think you can build a sturdier case for bringing Kevin back than you can Andrew. The case to bring Andrew back, I, I believe, is a little bit flimsier than the case to bring back Kevin. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Albert Breer was one of the people who said at halftime on, on Amazon Prime that, that They'll both be back. Now, it's early. Things can change. If the Browns lose every game the rest of the season, could that change? We'll see. I've never loved the idea of firing Kevin Stefanski. I had come around on the idea that if they brought in a new GM and he absolutely wanted to change the coaches, I was okay with it. Uh, but I think the right call ultimately, to me, is finding another GM to pair with Kevin Stefanski. Right. But it sounds like, at least as of right now, the plan is is to, to keep it steady. And as much as I'm not a big Andrew Berry fan... And this season has been overall a disaster until last night. There is something to be said for continuity. Uh, you listen, I, I believe that when you have seasons like this, you find out how good you are, who you are, when you're going through trouble or adversity. You don't find out much if you, when you're winning games and you're sky high. I'm going to find out, and we're finding out more about Kevin Stefanski this year and right now under this situation than any other time that it was last year. The Browns came out against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and people talked about them potentially giving up or quitting. We talked about it all last week. That didn't happen this week. Miles Garrett came out ready to go. He played one of his best games of the year. Uh, Jameis Winston rallied to the troops. Nick Chubb, who we talk about later on, two touchdowns after uh, you know being on the field injured. I think he, you showed that Kevin Stefanski has a grasp on what's going on. Now, guess what? We're week to week. Anything can happen. There's a lot of different people that will come out and say, Jay, I don't know. They got beat three games in a row, and there'll be some people that say he needs to go. But I think that one thing is I'm positive about the evaluation. 
and he's going to get that evaluation period. I think this is a good sign for him and Andrew Barry that they did win a game like that against the Steelers. I know Bull doesn't put much stock in the Coach of the Year award, and I'm a, a bit of a skeptic too. It does seem to go to the coach of the moment, maybe the coach that came out of nowhere, had a big surprise. Um, but I do think that Kevin Stefanski is widely regarded by his peers to be in the upper echelon of coaches. Is he top five? No. Is he top ten? You can make a real case for it, even though the playoff record and success isn't there. Is he top half? I think absolutely. And in a league that turns over about eight coaches a year, that means you only have to go two years before you cycle half of the head coaches out of the league. In the past, the Browns have made the mistake of moving on too soon. Way back, Bill Belichick. And, and th there was a lot of things that went on there. But I also think in the recent uh, set of examples, from a player standpoint, they moved on from Baker Mayfield too soon. Bull said something. There is something to be said about continuity. I couldn't agree with that more. I think you have the coach figured out. Now go figure out the quarterback and the general manager. Those are the three tent poles to a successful organization. There's four of them. The other one is the owner. But I do think that they've got the right guy. And I'm with you, Jace. I don't know about Andrew Barry yet, but I, I, I think I do know on Kevin Stefanski. Let's talk about Nick Chubb. Just at three yards of carry last night. So I don't, I don't think that's going to wow anybody. But the fact that he scored two touchdowns and fought for some really, really big yards... It put the exclamation point on his redemption story. What do you guys make of Nick Chubb and what he was able to do last night? Well, I think it was it was great to see him back in the end zone. I, you know, that game was a classic AFC North game. It was it, it was beautiful in the way that the fans were out there. It was snowing. It just looked like it was something off NFL films that you look back on and say, wow, I wish I was at that type of game. Um, Nick Chubb, the yards per carry aren't going to wow you, but then again, when you, you're playing in a game like that, you want tough money yards. You got to just stick it up in there and get it going and, and get the touchdowns. I think he really did a really great job of putting his, his helmet down, putting his shoulder pads low and getting low. And, and more than anything, I always try to look back and see where I was a year, a year before. Every time that you look back, you want to be doing better than you were the year before. And Nick Chubb, where he was a year ago, was probably in one of the darkest moments of, of his life. Congratulations to him for being able to come back mm -hmm. and put a bow on that and, and put two touchdowns on the board. Nick Chubb right now is, of course, not the player he was. And so there's a little sadness in that. But I do believe he is just young enough that he could eventually, and I, I believe it, and, and I conned <laughs> myself into believing that Nick Chubb would pull off the Adrian Peterson and be great immediately. <coughs> but every other running back that has come back from knee surgeries, it's taken them a uh, to the second year before they were back to the guy they were again. Now, some guys get too old, and that never happens. I believe Nick Chubb next year will be back to the back he was. But he shows you moments where he can drag guys for a couple of yards in big spots at the goal line, big spots of fourth down. Yeah, the yards per carry are awful. They're, you know, they're the, by far the worst of his career, not only in this game, but for the season. The offensive line hasn't, you know, been great at run blocking, although they were a little better yesterday. I thought the offensive line probably played its best game yesterday. So it, it's, it's weird not to see amazing runs from Nick Chubb because he's just not there yet. But you're seeing part of the Nick Chubb specialness in his ability to grind and get the extra yard in tough sledding. I don't know that Nick Chubb will ever be the Nick Chubb that we remember. He might not. I, I think he will. I, I think that. I, th I think those days are probably over, actually. But it was great to see last night against the team that really sort of <laughs> sidetracked his entire career, derailed his career with that knee injury last year, to come back and score two touchdowns again last night, and then in typical Nick Chubb fashion leave the locker room without talking to anybody, without talking to the media. That's Nick. Score two touchdowns, play against the team that ended your season last year, and then get out before anyone can ask you about it. So it was a great moment for him. Uh, the Browns have a lot of hard decisions to make with Nick Chubb after the season in terms of a contract, what to offer, if to offer, and those are conversations we can have at another time. But uh, for the moment, for yesterday, for last night, it was great to see. Every once in a while, generational probably, a player comes along that you as a fan absolutely say he needs to play his entire career here. That's Nick Chubb. 
I can't even begin to think of seeing him in, God forbid, a Steelers uniform mm-hmm. or a Jets. It makes, oh, it makes me feel sick, actually, yeah. to think about yeah. it. He's that guy. I, I disagree with I'm not going to say he is going to be the player he once was, but I am not nearly as close to saying that he'll never be that guy as you guys are because he's Whoa, I just up. said I think he will. No. I don't think he will No, be. Jason, Jason said, said he I don't think he said you guys, though. I, I, I thought I you think were... He, you, no, I said he won't be this year, but I yeah, think he will okay. be next year. I do, too. I think there's a, cha- I, a reasonable chance. Well, we saw him on a dry, fast track last week. He averaged five yards a carry. That's Nick Chubb. That, that's Nick Chubb. That's the guy that he's been for his entire career. I think you're right. It was too presumptuous to think that we might see that this year. Yeah. The injury he suffered was devastating. If anyone can do it, it's 24. My sincere hope is, because you said they're going to have to make a difficult decision at the end of this year. In a normal situation, you overpay him and you swallow it. You don't even think about it. But now, with the Deshaun Watson contract, that deal for Deshaun Watson becomes worse if they can't sign Nick Chubb because of the financial handcuffs on their wrists over Deshaun Watson. I hope yeah. that's not the well, case. I don't think there's anybody... Uh, there's not going to be another team offering him that much money. I read an article there, yesterday yeah. that talked about suitors, potential suitors for Nick Chubb. Nobody's, there were more teams listed than I thought. Yeah. Nobody's going to overpay him. But they're not going to overpay no, him next year. I'm not 29 saying you to overpay and, him. And, yeah. But the Browns are probably in the worst possible position to overpay somebody right now because they're overpaying somebody by $85 million next year. Hey, hey look, you know, like my, my dad always say, hey, man, when the light bill do, we're going to find a way to pay the light bill. <laughs> Something else got to get cut out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, we, if we're not eating. <laughs> I, I think the Browns right. absolutely need to address the position at, with a young player also because Jerome Ford doesn't appear to be the yeah. next running back. But I, I would, at the very least, bring back Nick Chubb for one for another year and, and see what he should retire as a Cleveland. Brown. He should. I agree with that. I hope that happens, and I hope it's later than sooner. All right, uh, big picture Browns win. Uh, I think best game of the year, the, the highest high of the year. What, what's your big takeaway from last night's game? Jameis Winston is trying to um, make his case. You know, we talked about it a lot, man. You may not have an opportunity to have a high uh, high price draft pick to get. One of the, you know, the guys like Cam Ward or Shador Sanders, um, the free agent class isn't the greatest. You know, there's guys like Sam Darnold, who has also been a retrade and, and found some, some, you know, good play in Minnesota. But Jameis Winston, for what he's done, let's be real. If, if these numbers were Deshaun Watson numbers, we would be clapping and saying, okay, if he would have thrown for the 400 yards that, that Jameis did last week, we'd have been ecstatic. We would have made up. We'd say, "Hey, we, we know that we didn't get to win, but at least we understand that Deshaun Watson is is playing the type of football we can win with." But it just so happens that this is Jameis Winston. I think he's a great leader. I think he showed a lot of, of, of just class. I think he motivates the guys. And to get a win, all of a sudden against the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens, I can't count that on my hand how many times I've been watching the Browns. And guys have done that. And so it's, it was very impressive the way he did it in the weather. Was he perfect? No. But the thing about Jameis Winston is he's making a case to be a bridge quarterback. And, and we should learn from Joe Flacco. Let's not pause or pump the brakes. We, we, let's, let's see if this thing matriculates, Bull. Um, but I, I think that's what the main takeaway was for me. Although, to be fair... I'm kind of glad they got rid of Flacco because they brought in Winston instead. Winston never <laughs> happens if they right. bring back Flacco. So it was actually the right move to get rid of Flacco they, and replace him with Winston. But they dumb lucked into that. Yeah, they, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, Flacco has crashed back to earth this year. He has. Yes. You know what? Everybody says that because he got benched. He got benched because why are you going to play a 40-year-old when you have no chance at the playoff? He got, right. he Go look playoff. at Joe's well, They have numbers. a chance at the playoffs. Joe's numbers are not bad. But wait a second, Jay. They're only a game out of a playoff spot. They're not making the playoffs. They got a much better chance than the Browns do. Sure. They do. They're yeah. making the decision that we want to see what we have in this kid. And I don't blame them, by the way. I think right, that's the right but call. I, I, Flacco wasn't playing great. He was His playing. numbers are not bad. I looked him up this morning. Yeah. Okay, but 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 uh, the bottom line is Jameis is has more potential to yes. be a short term, long term answer yes, more than than Joe Flacco sure, does. Ford. So I, I to me, I, I think Jameis gets a ton of credit. I gave him the most credit for the win. But Miles Garrett was outstanding yesterday. He made, you know, on a national television game when he was going up. You know, I asked Bernie about, you know, when you played against Boomer, when you played against Dan Fouts and Dan Marino and these guys, like, did it get you up a little more? And he was like, yeah, well, I knew I had to play better when I was playing against a better quarterback. And Miles Garrett took it personally. 
uh, some of the slander from from J.J. Watt and T.J. Watt. And uh, he sent a message yesterday, I'm the man. And then he said it directly after the game. Which stunned me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to what G said with uh, the Jameis thing. I've never gotten the impression from the Browns that they looked at him as a long-term solution at quarterback. But right now, he's playing well enough they can't really get him out of that spot. So you ride it out for the rest of the season – you're probably going to win enough games that you're not going to have, you're not going to be in a position to get one of the top guys in this draft. I don't know that it's a great quarterback draft to begin with. And, and then you have to see, like, is Jameis going to be the guy you want for next year? Are there other reclamation projects you want to go out there and look at and, and find? But for right now, Jameis was not supposed to be that guy, but he has played well enough to this point. I don't know how you get him out of that Yeah, spot. I'm rooting for him. I don't know how you can't. Uh, I'll just sum it up by saying great team win yeah all right we're taking a break when we come back the cleveland cavaliers have an interesting problem they have almost too much talent who should the Cavs play in their rotations based on what we've seen so far we'll dive into that when we open the cleveland sports show on wkyc comes right back Welcome back to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show on WKYC. Let's talk Cavaliers. After the loss to Boston, they bounced back in a big way. Had a nice win against a Pelicans team that I think dressed five players <laughs> that Six night. Six and a half. Uh, they won 128-100, and in doing so, they moved to 16-1. Jason, you teased at the top of the show, their problem is too much talent. Yeah. When everyone's healthy, and that means Struess is back and able to play, yeah. how is Atkinson going to divvy up the minutes? What's your eight-man rotation look like? Nine? I, I don't nine. know. I, yeah, maybe I, ten. I, I think you you have to go. You might have to go to ten. I, I think Struce starts, at least for now. You're mm-hmm. certainly paying him like a starter. Uh, he's had the spot all last year, so he'll reclaim that spot. And then I don't know how you get Ty Jerome off the floor. I don't know how you get Karis LeVert off the floor. George Niang's playing well. Dean Wade, when he's healthy, gives you quite a bit. Isaac Okoro actually might be the guy that gets cut. I think going into the season, really, Isaac was the guy who was going to get squeezed a little bit on minutes just because of – and he shot it really, really well. But you can't play 11 and 12 guys. Like, you just can't. Uh, even 10 is a stretch. You can, like, you can try. You can do it for a while. We, I didn't even mention Sam Merrill. So right. it, it really is a good problem to have that they legitimately have too many good players right now. So I, I think Isaac is the one who will probably feel the squeeze when, when Struz comes back. You know, I, listen, it's a good problem to have. Um, the way the NBA works is you got a lot of back-to-backs. You got nights where guys get injured. Um, we look at it. Uh, Dean Wade was starting. He had a couple of really nice games. He got sick. Isaac Okoro got back into the lineup. When Dean came back, Isaac was still playing. Isaac missed some games. They said, okay, well, Sam Merrill's going to play, and Ty Jerome's minutes are going to be uh, be where they are. But by the way, if there's one person whose minutes are not getting taken, it is Ty Jerome. I hope not. Ty, Ty Jerome is different right now. Ty Jerome is playing like he he feel like he a starter. Well, Ty, he's not going to get starter minutes when everybody's back. But hey, hey, listen, I don't, yeah. I'm going to keep it real. I, I, <laughs> hey, look, look, I'm going to ride this hot hand. It, it, as long as Ty Jerome is doing, when, when, I, when I was at that game and, and he shooting the ball the way he's shooting from half court, Ty Jerome going to get all the minutes that he can carry. But you, it'll usually work itself out. Guys get injured. Yeah. I don't think you got to worry about it now. It'll be a little bit of a conversation when it comes to the playoffs because then you, you ratcheted that down. See, I'd want to start Dean Wade because I think he's the best defender. He's bigger. And, like, you, uh, your starting lineup has four good offensive players – and so I want my best defender. The guy can help rebound. He can shoot and he can score. So I would start him over Max Drews. I know they're probably not going to do that. Well, the issue there is you what little size you have coming off the bench. Yeah. Well, then start Isaac Okoro. I, I, he's even a better defender. So I, I, I would do that too. And I, uh, to me, Sam Merrill's the guy that's going to be out of the mix. I mean, he's, he's going to be out of the mix at the end of the bench because you just have guys that can do what he can do better and do other things. Size too. Yeah. To answer the question, I think you're yeah. right. Sam Merrill's the guy. Yeah. Everybody else that we've mentioned as these fringe or rotational guys yeah. brings something really good to the table. Here's the good thing about this. This is the best problem. Teams would love to have this problem. That's right. On certain nights, you're going to go up against size. You go with your size matchup. Yeah. On other nights, you're going to need better defense and quickness. You go with your smaller, quicker lineup. Also, not mentioned, you're going to need depth throughout the season. Injuries happen. So far, knock on wood, Cavs have been pretty lucky. And I, 
But and yeah. you're keeping the the minutes down. The load yeah. management for Kenny Atkinson. He's like, what load management problem? He's he's yeah. handling that wonderfully. And by the way, we didn't even mention Jalen Tyson, and I get it. He's not going to play legitimate minutes, but right. but he's and, an option. And it was against the G League team, but he looked great in that game. I, I get know. it. That that was a joke of a team right. that night. But you had to love what you saw. So if they have to give him minutes, like. And right now, I think the easy thing is, I think we all trust Kenny Atkinson to make the right call. I, I, I'm going to ask Jason a question as we wrap this up. Yeah. In my mind, this is the deepest Cavs team they've ever had, including the LeBron years, even with Love and Kyrie. Mm. There were weaknesses when mm. you got into eight, 7, 8, 9. I don't see weaknesses uh, on this uh, team. Okay. I, think the, 16. I think the top end talent was Oh, no, better. no, I'm not talking sure, about top end talent. Just, yeah, I agree. Said, if yeah. you want to talk, I know, this isn't if you the want best to talk 9, 10, 11, sure. I can't remember a time in yeah. Cavs history when they were that but, loaded, but that deep. you're going to win more with the top six 100%. than you are with 9, 10, uh, Of course you are. Yeah. McNuggets but, is going to be the rap. I can't even rebuttal. Go ahead, McNuggets. Well, no, Two, I think 20, you think I said 20, best. 20, I'm yeah. not saying best. I'm saying deep. 2016 is tough. Let's play a game between the 7, 8, 9 players from the 16 team and the seven, eight, nine players from this year's team. That's I'll a, take this year. That's a good topic. We might like talk about year. that one day. All right, we're taking a break. Speaking of too much talent, the Guardians bullpen has too much talent, and they've moved Eli Morgan three and zero with an ERA under two last year. What move could be next? That's next when the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show on WKYC comes right back. Welcome back to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. So the Guardians made a move. I think it surprised a lot of people. I was yeah. a, caught a little off guard by it because I thought Eli Morgan had a really nice season last year yeah. and played a big role in a bullpen that had an all-time great year. Um, what's the next move for this team? What do you what do we see them doing down the road? One thing that they have to, I don't know if it's next, but one thing they have to do is make a decision on Josh Naylor. And that's something that we don't really talk about a whole lot. Kyle Manzardo is the future of that spot, I think, mm-hmm. at first base. Naylor has a year left on his contract. I, I think Manzardo has to play first. Absolutely. So are you going to make that switch and make Naylor the DH next year and then let him leave possibly as a free agent after next year? Or do you try and trade Josh and get something for him and install Kyle as the everyday first baseman? That's I, I don't know if that's next on the list, but that's something that they have to figure out this offseason. All right. Jay, the, Bra- the, the Guardians absolutely have to get a legitimate middle of the lineup hitter. They're not going to spend that kind of money in free agency, but they can do it via trade, and that's what they need to do. In this particular trade, they traded for a minor leaguer who's got a lot of upside. I know a couple of people I follow that, that are like diehard Cub minor league guys were disappointed that the Cubs gave up this prospect for Eli Morgan. Mm. I think it's actually a fair trade because Morgan will have a key role in the Cubs pen because unlike the Guardians, the Cubs pen sucks. So um, I, I think that makes a difference. But I, I think absolutely making a trade for a legitimate power hitter, middle of the lineup hitter is the move for the Guardians. And absolutely, they got to think about Naylor because Manzardo has to play first base next year. Well, listen, we, if you rewind the tape, man, it sounds like 2021, 2022, 2023. Jay, how likely are they going to trade and get a middle order back? Well, I... I agree with both of you guys. I'm working this hot stove season on doing one of two things with Josh Naylor. Either trying to sign him, not at a superstar deal, because I don't think he's a superstar, but he might want that kind of money. When you look at the numbers and the production, it's in the superstar category. I'm not paying him superstar money because he's a one-way player. He's going to be my designated hitter, period. He can no longer play first base. That's right. He was exposed last year, particularly in the playoffs. So I'm doing one of two things. I'm going to him and saying, we want to work a deal with you. If we can find a framework, we're going to do it. If we can't, we're trading you. I do not think we'll see Josh Naylor in a uniform next year as the season starts unless he gets an extension. He's a piece. You could get something in return for him. Now, because you have one year of team control, you're not going to get a replacement player. You're not going to get an equal middle of the bat, middle of the lineup sure. bat. But Manzardo's time is now. I saw in the playoffs that yes. moments aren't too big for him. Uh, the second time around, he was much better at the big league level. So I think that's the answer. I think that that's where you're targeting your big offseason move from here. By the way, kudos to Jose Ramirez, who finished top five in the MVP voting for, I believe, the sixth time. I think he's the only player in baseball that's done that over the last eight years. Incredible. Mm. 
All right, that's going to do it. Thank you, Browns, for getting our weekend started on a positive note. We can relax for the next eight, nine, ten days. That's a good thing. We hope you watch us every Monday through Friday, Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show on the YouTube channel. Have a great weekend. Go Buckeyes! We didn't even get to talk about them. Peace!